Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 14th of January. I'm finally back from my hiatus as I finish with my exams. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the past week or so because I've not been present to give frontline updates. So today is really gonna be focusing on the minutia of the changes and then hopefully in future videos, I'll be able to expand on the broader battlefield situation. Today we're gonna to begin by looking at the Orkiv sector, which has been defined over the past month and a half by the Russians actually getting the initiative and beginning to conduct localized advances in the Ukrainians, moving away their resources and some brigades that were slated for the counteroffensive to other parts of the front line where there really is an onus on the Ukrainians to defend. And so the Ukrainian units that remain in the sector, they have withdrawn from certain positions on a very small scale. So for instance, some of the Ukrainian fort positions that were located in fields and dugouts just to the north of Russia's fortified Syrovikan line have been abandoned and the Ukrainians have coalesced in some of the trenches to the east of Rabaltine, just several kilometers north. In an area where that's manifested recently is in the area west of Rabove, which we're going to look at now. So at the height of the counteroffensive, the Ukrainian control looked something like this where they had control of the anti-tank ditch and the dragon's teeth and the manned trench that I'm marking in blue. And over the past couple of weeks, the Russians have chipped away at this Ukrainian control. And a lot of this has been due to the Ukrainians withdrawing themselves. And as Ukrainians withdrew, the VDV entered those areas with BMDs. And this is recorded by geolocated footage and set up positions in this area where I have the red arrows on the 8th of January. And since then, the Russians have capitalized on their gains and I've taken back further open fields and the entirety of this manned trench that I'm marking now in red. And really the Ukrainian presence past the Suravikin line has largely evaporated at this point. In one instance, the Russians actually overran the Ukrainian position. And this was an area where the Ukrainians had been sending a lot of resources trying to hold the line. Trying to then actually expand into Verbova itself throughout the counteroffensive. It's around this a trench over here, not really a trench, but a tree line, and there's a lot of dugouts that run parallel to it. And so in this specific case, we have a geolocated video showing the VDV reportedly killing five Ukrainian soldiers and taking one POW in the assault in the videos on my map. And so that's just a brief summary of this part of the front line. And this is all happening despite the poor weather conditions in Zaporozhia. But again, if it's bad in Zaporozhia, then it's also probably even worse in areas like Luhansk and Donetsk that are located to the northeast of Zaporozhye Oblast in the Orykiv sector. So just as an example, here is the temperatures for Zaporozhye city. You could see that throughout December, it was like a baseline of five. And then at a certain point last week, like around the 8th of January, there was a steep decline in the temperatures. So it reaches the freezing temperatures. It's like reaching minus five, minus 10 in some instances. And you, this is also applying for the minimum and maximum temperatures. So really all day it is really bad temperature, not just in terms of whether it's cold or not, but also in terms of the cloud cover. There's a lot of fogginess. And this is all reported on by on the Ukrainian side. Also a lot of precipitation reported in certain instances. And so this is not conducive for any offensive activity for either side. And this applies not just to Zaporozhye, but to, to the entire battlefield. And that's why the beginning of January has not seen that many changes in comparison to the beginning of December. In the beginning of December, we saw a lot of changes, especially on the Russian side, advancing. And now it's really subsided as both sides have taken this time to recuperate and build up their own forces and defenses. So despite the general decrease in fighting, there are still heavy clashes in and around Novomikhailivka. The Russian forces did attempt to try to establish a foothold within the village via the southern outskirts including the cemetery and all the warehouses over there they were unable to do that and came under assault from ukrainian drones from the 79th air assault brigade from the prone drone unit for instance that was just one example and you had a ukrainian local counterattack to push back the russians and so the new front line looks something like this where the gray zone is basically just the fields and the southern outskirts that separate the Russian line and the Ukrainian line, which is within the center of the village. But at the same time, the Russian forces continued gaining on the flanks of Novomikhailivka, getting control of these fields and the tree lines running along it. And they were also able to advance through the fields located further southwest around this area over here. But 
generally the armored assaults and also the infantry-based assaults on the southern flanks of Novo Mikhailivka have decreased over the past week or so. And at the same time, we've seen an uptick in Russian attacks on Novo Mikhailivka's northern flank, where there are several interesting targets for the Russians to acquire. One of them would be the Zhvaryanets fortification system, which is still not under Russian control. At the moment, I have it marked as a gray zone because there's not really any proof of either side getting control of it. But it is a highly fortified area that gives you good firing positions to overlook all of the fields in the surrounding regions. And you also have some local heights that currently are in the gray zone or under Ukrainian control that are just to the north of Novomi Khalifka, which could help with controlling the getting a direct line of fire and a direct line of sights onto the Ukrainian positions within the valley of Novomi Khalifka. And so that would be just some of the rationale behind the Russians advancing in that direction. But you also have various Ukrainian fortifications that have been built along the tree lines. And just the general idea of flanking it from another direction and enveloping the village from three different sides is something that looks appealing for Russia. Especially because the Ukrainians have not really invested that many resources into the northern flank so far. And so again, that could be the rationale behind the uptick in attacks in this region. And so we have just some of those videos over here. In one instance, you actually had the 79th Air Assault Brigade repelling one such Russian assault. It was a pretty small armored assault, but in the end, it was one tank and one BMP destroyed by the 79th. And in response to the Russian uptick in this region, the Ukrainians moved in some of their tanks in this region. For instance, one T-64 was moved to the line of contact and... Upon reaching that area, the Russian units that are engaged in this region, which include the 33rd Motor Rifle Regiment and the 255th Regiment, uh, they actually caught sight of it, and the 33rd hit it, the T-64 with an ATGM, and then that same tank actually ended up getting destroyed by a mine that was placed in the region. So again, that's another region, uh, reason that it's difficult to conduct armored assaults in this northern flank, because the Ukrainians themselves have also placed a lot of minefields uh, laid a lot of it in the gray zone so that's a threat both for the russians and the ukrainians in this case it led to that destruction so for now the front line does not really change over here but i would keep an eye out for what occurs in this region and at the same time there is still heavy russian bombardment of the village of novome Khalifka itself with the ukrainians reporting heavy tos1a shelling and then attacks by su-25s and k-52 attack helicopters Around Marinka, the Ukrainians are trying to solidify defenses within the eastern parts of Herhivka and the pace of the Russian advance has slowed down following the capture of Marinka. But the Russians are now trying to turn this entire church compound into their forward operating base and trying to gradually expand block by block, house by house, into Herhivka itself. But it is a very long and arduous process. And Herhivka really isn't Russia's main priority during this winter season. Of course it is. One of their objectives to advance in this direction past Marinka, but there are several higher priorities, for instance, Novome Khalifka, as I said before. At the same time, the Russians also advanced through this tree line over here, trying to reach this local height over here that I have marked in uh, red. And now let's move on to the situation on the Evdivka front. Moving on to Pervomyska, on the 11th of January, the Russian forces expanding control in some of the dachas along the main road over here and through some of the houses adjacent to the pond where you have more shrubbery so there was a minor russian advance the russian forces are clearing out each house individually in this region a lot of the houses are destroyed it's not reached the marinka levels yet they do have a lot of ukrainian defensive positions in dugouts in the backyards of these houses and in the basements and that's the rationale behind having to go through and clear them all out and as you can see it's a very narrow village and so the fact that it's taking so long also has to do with the fact that the Russians are not making Pervomyska its main priority. But the garrison that they, they do have slated to take over this town is engaging in very fierce combat to advance in this region. And the pace clearly shows that the Ukrainian defenders are making it very difficult to give an inch. And as we really entered this poor weather season, the Russian forces also decreased focus on the wider Marinka direction or sorry Avdivka direction especially on the flanks of Avdivka we've not really seen many reports or videos of armored assaults or infantry assaults on the southern flank for instance around Severin and Tonenke and so the Russian forces a couple of weeks ago or maybe a month by now 
were actually able to develop this salient through the fields, trying to put pressure on Zatonenka and Severna. But at a certain point, due to the Russians decreasing their offensive activities and just digging in at their current lines, it became untenable for them to hold such northernmost positions, you could say, in this region that looks pretty exposed. And eventually, they just withdrew to this more solid line with the Ukrainians actually taking back those fields and protecting the flanks of their city or this village on the front line, Severna. So while the Russian assaults on the flanks have subsided, there is an increase in Russian attacks on the northern outskirts of Avdivka. We're seeing that especially in the dachas located to the east of the Avdivka coke plant. And we have evidence of a Russian advance based on this geolocated video, which shows how the Ukrainian defenders from the 110th Mechanized Brigade and the 2nd Battalion of the 1st Presidential Brigade were able to attack the Russian forces during their advance. And so you had some of the Russian vehicles, presumably coming from the water treatment facility and from this road from the east, from Kamiyanka all the way to the Dachas, in this combined assault further south to take over some of Ukraine's fort positions in the Dachas and the forested areas. And so eventually you had the FEVs from the Ukrainian defenders targeting the Russian vehicles. Nonetheless, the Russian infantry dismounted. But by the end, we saw this photo over here, this footage from some of these Dachas that are relatively isolated in this forested patch. And it showed the deaths of several Russian soldiers that were killed, presumably by FEV drones or by drones that dropped grenades. And this is an area where the Russians had previously not been located, so it does appear to be a new video. And it would show that the Russians are continuing their assaults, and they're actually using pretty large squads in tandem working to advance in this region. But in this specific case, for instance, they actually uh, were killed in the attack, was not able to develop into anything more than that. But we now do have an idea of where the front line is demarcated. And just like I was just saying about the flanks of Avdivka, just like the south, on the north, you also have the Ukrainians conducting this minor advance, taking back some of Russia's four positions just to the south of Novokalinove in this polygon over here that is marked in blue. Now moving on to the Seversk front, this is an area where we actually have seen an uptick in Russian attacks relative to previous months. And the bar for increasing attacks is pretty low just because the Russian focus on this area was really non-existent. You didn't see many Russian attacks, let alone armored assaults, on some of these Ukrainian forward positions for really over a year since the Bakhmut operation. And now we're seeing an uptick. So, for instance, you have this one axis of attack along this railroad just to the northeast of Vesele. And then you also have a lot of Russian pressure on Spirini. So around Spirni, the Russian forces are still in the center of the village trying to clear it out. Where again, there is very fierce Ukrainian resistance and a lot of fortifications that were built within the residential parts in the westernmost sector of that village. But nonetheless, the Russian forces have been able to advance based on this polygon, which shows the recent gains. And there's also those attacks to the south of Spirni, which have not been able to yield much results by the Russians. But there's still pressure on that southern flank. And as I said before... You have Russian infantry organizing in small groups and advancing along this railroad. And we can see the extent of their advances creating this little salient over here. And this was all recorded by the Ukrainian side where you had the Ukrainians 10th Mountain Infantry Brigade and their FEV drone unit Tystra. It hit Russian infantry on the rail line which prevented any sort of further advance. But it does give us an idea of where the Russians were able to reach. Looking at the Zharbets River front, we'll see that the Ukrainians were able to take back some of the land that they lost in my previous video where I talked about the entire sector from Kremina to Liman. Because in that last video, we had this video over here from the Ukrainian side showing them shelling Russian forces in an area that was pretty deep into what was previously imagined to be the Ukrainian lines. So this indicated that there was a Russian advance that occurred you know, in early January. But now we have new video footage posted by the Russian side, which indicates the Ukrainians were able to turn the tides and retake some of the lost territory, as marked over here. In this video, we see that the Russian forces were shelling the Ukrainians as they were digging additional trenches and building up their fortification system around this one forested area. And this seems like an area where there's a lot of foliage, a lot of trees, 
that were built up. So it is a good area to set up defenses. It is very close to the front line though. And so you do have a lot of Russian forces directing artillery strikes at that region. The Ukrainians are still trying to build it up though in order to turn it into a fortress on the front line to prevent any sort of changes to the front line for the time being. And that's why we saw the Ukrainians also moved in some reserves to this region. They wanted to stabilize the front line, which they probably achieved about a week ago or maybe even more by now. And then they were able to conduct this localized counterattack and reestablish control over some key forested areas that they wanted under uh, their control to then build up into fortifications as we now see the Russians are targeting those regions. Now looking at the Kupiansk front, there were reports from the Ukrainian side mentioning a localized counterattack in the area to the southwest of that village. So basically around here, that's where the allegation is that the Ukrainians were able to get control over some of those ditches and open fields. I didn't see any visual evidence for that, but I wanted to just throw that out for you guys. And then looking at Persia Travinova itself, this is a forward operating node for Russian forces before they are sent into attacks to gradually expand the Russian sphere of control through the fields that are located on the wider Kupiansk sector. And so as they were doing this, in the recent days, they were spotted by the 14th Brigade, which is one of the Ukrainian units operating closer to the Sinkivka area, but they definitely have battalions that are operating around Persia Travnevel as well. And so their FEV drone units was able to direct attacks towards several Russian troop clusters that were organizing in the roads around the village as they were trying to make their way southwards, and they hit those Russian forces directly. And so that doesn't tell us much about the front line, but it does tell us where the Russian forces are organizing before they advance further south to conduct their attacks that I should mark in red. And lastly, looking at Sinkivka, the Russian forces have been slightly pushed back from their forward-most positions that were located just to the north of the village of Sinkivka. Again, the Russians do still hold or uh, retain positions in the forested area south of the Mont Perishi, and so that is a stepping stone to attack Sinkivka. Really, the issue is this open field this gap in between the russian line and sinkivka itself the area is filled with mines and it's really turned into a kill zone for russian vehicles as you have a lot of ukrainian drone operators and artillery and also ukrainian atgm crews and just infantry in general holding back the russian assaults and so for now the ukrainians have been able to turn sinkivka into their forward defense node and repelled numerous russian assaults and over the past week the russian intensity of assaults has decreased I don't think we've seen many uh, armored assaults during that time. And so for now, the losses on both sides in turn have also decreased. But at the same time, you have the Russian side releasing new drone footage from the Sinkivka area, specifically from the Sudoplatov battalion. And they have been hitting Ukrainian targets very hard, especially to the west of Sinkivka. They've been targeting a lot of Russian or sorry, Ukrainian BMPs, tanks, and within Sinkivka. They've been targeting vehicles that are advancing through the roads towards the line of contact that are housing equipment and infantry. And previously, we didn't have that footage to give us an idea of the Russian side of things in the sector. But now we do have that video to give us perspective. And so that's really all I have for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.